Hello everyone, and welcome to the High Performance Computing in Julia module. I'm Dr. Jamie Mayer, and I'll be your instructor for this course. I'm a research and teaching fellow at the University of Nottingham, and my research focuses primarily in machine learning and statistical physics. I created this course with the aim of teaching early PhD students everything they need to be able to write high performance software for their research. In research, it can be extremely helpful to write high performance software because we don't always have the luxury of a high performance package that does everything we need it to do. This course will give you the foundations that you need to start writing this type of software that makes the most out of the hardware that you have available, whether that's just your laptop or your university's supercomputing cluster. In this video, we will introduce the syllabus for this module along with some motivation as to why you might be interested in learning these skills. We'll start off with the format of the course. This course will be delivered through these videos along with accompanying notes, both of which will be available online. This material will be released progressively over the next five weeks, starting from Monday the 20th of January, 2025. If you are working towards your PhD in physics from any of the universities listed on screen now, you're eligible for credits towards your degree and you can formally register with the link in the description. If you wish to gain credits for this course, you will also need to pass five assignments. These assignments will be available to everyone who would like to practice their skills learnt throughout the course, whether you are formally registered or not. Information about the assessment for this module will be given in a later video. Next, let's take a look at the syllabus for this module. Broadly, the content will be split over five weeks. In the first week, we will learn the fundamentals of how computers operate. In particular, we will learn how a computer takes the source code that you write and transforms it into something that the computer can understand and execute. On top of this theory, we will learn about modern computer hardware, which will help to ground discussions of code optimization later on in the course. Finally, I'll introduce the Julia programming language and teach you the basics so that we can get started. This language will be used throughout this course and we'll learn more about it later on in this video. On to week two, we'll be introducing the idea of benchmarking and profiling so we can better understand the performance of our code. And once we know how to test our code's performance, we can learn how to optimize it to make sure it runs as quickly as possible. In week three, we will introduce parallel computing. We'll learn the underlying theory, as well as how we can speed up our algorithms by splitting work across multiple processes. Following this trend in parallel computing in week four, we will learn how to scale up our parallel algorithms to run across multiple computers which are networked together. We will see some examples of how we can run our code on a supercomputing cluster. Finally, week five will be totally focused on GPU programming, and we'll see how to make the most out of these powerful coprocessors that are starting to take over the numerical computing world. So now we've looked at the syllabus, I'd like to take a second to look at the historical trend in computing hardware, which will help shine a light on why you might find the skills in this module valuable. Many of you will have heard of Moore's Law, which is the historical observation that the number of transistors in an integrated circuit tends to double approximately every two years. Why is this important? Well, the transistors are the building blocks of modern processors. In general, the higher the number of transistors, the more powerful a chip can be. This is best seen graphically. Here is a plot showing the development of microprocessors over the past 50 years. You can see that in the 1970s, we only had chips with around 2,300 transistors. By 2010, manufacturers were producing chips with billions of transistors. One thing to notice about this graph is the logarithmic y-axis. Notice that straight lines actually show exponential increases. If we now plot the performance of these chips in sequential tasks, as measured by the spec in benchmark, we can see that the performance increased exponentially along with the number of transistors until around the late 2000s. What you can notice now is that this type of performance has started to plateau over the past 20 years. What this means is that processors today are only incrementally faster than the processors from five or so years ago. In the past, you could count on improvements in hardware to help push the boundaries of what is possible computationally. If you wanted to run a simulation of twice the size, you could just wait a year until the hardware caught up to your needs. This is not really the case anymore, at least for sequential tasks. If we care about the performance of our code, we need to make sure it is as efficient as possible, as we can no longer rely on hardware improvements to make up for software inefficiencies. What you will notice is that the number of transistors in these chips 
has still been increasing, even though it has very little effect on the performance. So what are all of these additional transistors being used for? Well, they're being used to create processors with multiple CPU cores, each being capable of processing information independently. So this is a true parallel computing capability in a single chip. If you take into account all of the cores on a modern processor, the theoretical max performance has been increasing over the past 20 years. But reaching this theoretical maximum can be quite difficult. Some algorithms are inherently sequential and do not benefit from this extra processing capability at all. Even algorithms which can benefit can be difficult to parallelize and it requires a lot of effort on the part of the developers. By the end of this course, you will know how to effectively make use of these additional cores in your own code. And finally, we will end this video talking about the language choice for this module. And of course, this is Julia. Now, Julia is a really interesting language, and I hope all of you will enjoy learning it and using it throughout this course. Now, if you're going to learn this new language, you should at least have an intuition as to why we should be learning this language. So there's a problem in the scientific computing community where in languages we are often presented with two options. You can either have a language that is fast or is easy to learn or easy to write. So Python is a great example here. Now Python is known for being very easy to write, also easy to learn. Even people who aren't computer scientists can create really impressive things using Python. You don't have to have a very deep understanding to get very far with this language. However, Python is also known for not being the fastest language, or at least Python by itself is not very fast. And it often relies on other packages written in different languages to be able to achieve the same speed. If you look at the languages that these packages are often written in, for example, C, you can see that it has the opposite problem. Code written in C is usually quite fast and is usually much faster than equivalent code written directly in Python. However, this code is not easy to write, and anyone who's learned C will probably tell you that it's much easier to write in Python than it is to write in C. Now, this is where Julia comes along. Julia tries to get the best of both worlds. It's quite simple, it's quite easy to write, it looks a lot like Python, but when it comes down to it, it can run at speeds approaching that of C. And usually, it's much easier to achieve a very high performance in Julia than it is in C. And this is something we'll explore throughout this course. This brings us to the end of the introductory video. In the next video, we'll talk about how this module will be assessed. Feel free to skip it if you are not formally sitting this as an MPAGS module. And with that, thank you for watching.